So we believe in a doctrine called dispensational salvation. So what does that mean? What that means is that we believe that in the Bible, Christians were saved by faith alone, not by works. Amen? Faith alone, not by works. But there's a problem. There are verses that seems to show faith and works for salvation. Our simple solution is to divide it. Those verses are referring to Old Testament Jews. And then the verses that talk about salvation by works will refer to the tribulation Jews. But there's a group out there that hates this doctrine of dispensational salvations. And they're going to be very dishonest by getting rid of these lines and combining it all together for one full salvation by faith. That is total dishonesty, and that is not dividing the scriptures where you can rescue a lot of people. Okay, so we insist right here that definitely our Christian salvation has no works whatsoever. It's faith alone. How can we easily believe that? It's because we divide it. So those verses in the Old Testament that talks about works for salvation, including the tribulation, it's just for those time periods, for those group of people, Jews in either the Old Testament or tribulation. Christians are not bound to that. Now, here are some of the dishonest arguments they're going to use to try to prove, no, it was all one salvation by faith. That's not going to convince a cult out there. I have, I have argued with cults out there, and I tried to use the method of trying to make a faith alone in all verses. It don't convince them. But when I divide it, do you know how many times they shut their mouth? Yeah. You know what the evidence for that is? The evidence is I go out and do soul winning. A lot of you probably don't who hate dispensational salvations. Okay, anyway, let's return to the point right here. In Luke chapter 16, verse 28, what we believe is this. We believe that there's a place called Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. Now, in Abraham's bosom, why did Old Testament saints go over there? They had to go over there because Jesus did not die on the cross yet. Because Jesus did not die on the cross yet, their sins were not completely taken away. So because of that, these Old Testament saints, they had no choice but to go to Abraham's bosom. Now, the funny thing is that these people, they accuse us for teaching this like limbo. And then when I call, out, call them out that, no, this is not limbo, you know what their best argument against this is? Their best argument is, Gene Kim doesn't even know what I'm arguing about. I didn't say it was limbo. I said it was like limbo. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. There's something strange right here. Something strange. That's your best argument. That I don't understand arguments. I apologize. I was wrong. I'm wrong. I'm so sorry. You disproved dispensational salvation. So let me correct myself. Like limbo, and whenever I say limbo, can some of you correct me, please, for out of respect for our opponents? Thank you. Okay, if I say limbo accidentally, say like limbo, okay? All right, so like limbo, quote unquote, they were stuck with their sins over there until Jesus died and rescued them. But they had no choice but to go by the law. Because remember, faith and works under the Old Testament, so they had no choice but to go by the law. Oh, that's nonsense. But that's nonsense? Okay, look at Luke chapter 16. Let's see what Abraham's bosom is. Look at verse 24. Uh, excuse me. Let's look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father. So this is Abraham's bosom, remember, where the rich man, Lazarus, and Abraham are at. That thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So the rich man doesn't want them, doesn't want his brothers to burn in hell. So underneath the earth, there's a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom, and a place of torment, hell. The rich man says, I don't want them to go to hell. He wants them where? In Abraham's bosom. So what does Abraham say right here? How they get there. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear that. Wow. Wow. Read the verse as it says. Now, if they want to get all deliberate, read the verse as it says. It never said law. Oh, my goodness. Verse 29, Moses and the prophets, right? Yeah. That is undoubtedly the law. But if you doubt that, then uh, let's look at verse 16. The what? Law, law and the prophets were until John. Okay, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. 
Before you embarrassed yourself by critiquing me online, I rescued you by mentioning that verse. That way you can pull up a better argument against me next time. I'm giving you so much advantage right here. You can spend endless days studying and trying to debunk me and spend hours and hours. All I need is a few minutes through the Word of God. Okay, now anyways, here's another thing. Look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Some of you people out there, I really, really pity you, and I mean that. My heart goes out to you when you fall into these wicked people who attack Bible-believing preachers and dispensational salvations, who the Bible-believing preachers and the doctrine rescued a lot of souls out there. If you don't believe me, the evidence is the people here and all the endless emails and phone calls I get. Okay, that's my evidence. I don't know about you people out there because you're locked up at home so busy destroying Bible believers. That's a mental issue. I hope that you will open your eyes and really look at yourself right here. This is a big problem for you guys. There's something wrong with your heart and spirit. Do you honestly believe God will bless your arguments when you have that kind of heart and spirit? I don't have that. What I do is I always think about souls, one. I also consider about their arguments, the good ones. I'll bring it up right here. Two, number three, number three, I want to do it where I edify people. My job is not to go on a jihad against Bible-believing preachers. Okay, now, let's look at Hebrews 9, verse 7 through 10. They don't believe this notion. Oh, they were already clean. They were already clean. Already clean? Look at Hebrews 9 right here, verse 7. The Bible says right here, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people, right? See, they were their sins. They weren't clean. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manif made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Ah, they couldn't go to heaven. See that? Where did they go? Okay, now let's keep reading right here. Uh, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present. Oh, there's a time change. Time then present. It said time too in case you want to say, no, time, uh, no, what that meant now meant the summary of all the arguments. Fooey, man, fooey. All right, let's keep reading here. It is weird, isn't it? Okay, verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service what? Perfect. See, they weren't perfect enough to go there. I, ins I insisted that all that time. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until what? The time of reformation. See, there was something right here concerning their sins. What do you mean? Oh, they were already clean. They went to heaven. Blah, 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 blah. What was this then? Okay, uh, let's keep reading here. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I want you all just pause the video, do our enemies a favor so that they don't get on me for saying I'm just going at a fast pace and fooling you. Do me a favor, okay? Why don't you do me a favor by pausing the video and looking through all of those verses again rather than hearing me shoot off my mouth on what the verses should mean like some of those enemies out there. Okay, now let's look at verse 15. 15. And for this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament, right? The Old Testament, New Testament. Why? Because what did he do? Keep reading. Uh, verse 15. That by means of death for the what? Redemption of the what? Transgressions that were under the what? Oh my goodness. This is limbo. Oh, excuse me. Oof. Like limbo. I'm so sorry. What in the cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo? You're not reading, man. You're not reading. Why are you so mean, pastor? Because these people attack Bible-believing preachers and attack dispensational salvation. For people out there who don't know about this and who disagree with this teaching, I don't have any beef against you. Although I will insist that this is an important doctrine, dispensational salvation, but I'm not going to kick you. But I have no respect for people who, who are complete losers wearing sweatshirts and wearing Trump and being pale-faced and going like this and can't even talk right when they're confronted with plain verse of Scripture. Amen. Do me a favor, huh? Okay, now anyways, let's see right here. So we see Hebrews 9, this is not some kind of limbo. Now they're going to... 
argue this. What about Enoch, right? Didn't he go up to heaven? Good point. What about Adam and Eve? They received the blessing of the animals. Good point. What about Abel? Not by the works like Cain does at the, uh, the sacrifice with the fruits and vegetables. Good point. Hey, let me help you out here. Let me help out the enemies right here, okay? This is good stuff, all right? I'm trying to be fair and giving you as much of an advantage. Samson, he failed in his works. He's a sinner. Guess what? The thief on the cross, he went through believing before Jesus died. Let me give you a bigger bonus. Didn't you know Jesus forgave the sins of wicked sinners long before he died on the cross like prostitutes and etc.? Wow. Wow. And then you can put in Lot. They always scream Lot, Lot, Lot. And they get on me talking about Noah, Noah, Noah. Oh, whatever. Okay, whatever. Okay, so let's stop being childish. The point is right here. I agree with you about all those points. What does that prove though? That proves the most important, one of the most important doctrines in dispensationalism is exceptions. And my argument for that is just look up intermediate discipleship number four video. Just watch that video. Don't get all mad and critique me. Watch that video first, then have the right to critique me by watching those arguments first, okay? Please do that. And then if you have a legitimate argument, then I'll argue why, okay? But you haven't watched the video, man. You haven't even watched the video. Just watch Intermediate Discipleship number four about exceptions. Besides, here's one example. Uh, this is just a quick example. The, didn't the Bible says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment? So the verse says that everyone's got to die, and then they go to judgment. Does that, oh, uh, Enoch, ah, oh, see, I thought that I had robot members in my church. That's what some of these losers will say, that these members are robots, that they're just watching. They're looking at the book. They're looking at the book. You got robot watchers. They're all watching you, listening to what you have to say. Okay, anyway, Enoch's the exception. Here's the idea. It's a general rule, everyone dies. But there is an exception. Why? Because God understands throughout certain cases that he's going to allow exceptions. Uh, Hezekiah, he, he was not able to clean the people before they partook in the festival but then the Lord gave them an exception. Yeah. This does not overthrow the general rule. Yep. The general rule is you die, you're saved by faith and works, and that's proven at all over the book of the Old Testament, as well as even your Pauline epistles, they even say that. So it points out right here that these are general rules, but it doesn't overthrow exceptions, and exceptions don't overthrow the general rule. Yep. This is an important fact that's logical as well. I'm not gonna get into that, just watch the video, okay? All right, you know what's their best argument against me? Some of their best arguments against me is that Hebrews 11:6. you can't please God without faith. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Did I deny faith right here? In the Old Testament, look at this wording. Yes, faith and works. You know why this faith is important? Because their works had to show it. Otherwise, if their works didn't show their faith, they're in trouble, man. They're in trouble. Okay, you know what their best argument against me is? Their, one of their best arguments against me is that they're going to point out Ruckman's problem with segregation or racism. Then they're going to point me out with segregation and racism. Then they're going to point out all these crazy, wacky teachings that Ruckman talks about or I talk about. And their best argument is pointing out any problem, ad hominem, ad hominem, ad hominem problems. You know why? Because they can't argue with scripture on dispensational salvations. Because I can argue that if you're going to give that kind of fair game to me and Ruckman, you got to do the same thing with Schofield, who joined the Confederate Army. You're going to have to do the same thing with Darby, who created his own Bible. You're going to have to do the same thing with Larkin and Schofield and all dispensationalists, your classic dispensationalists, who corrected your King James Bible. Why do you think Ruckman came out differently from them? Because Ruckman... He abided by exactly what the verses say in the King James Bible. And he realized undoubtedly there were different salvations. So he was not used to the mindset of these other dispensationalists who in, kept inserting their interpretation and correcting the scriptures. He left the scriptures as it said. And if you look at Dr. Upman's dispensationalism books, you will see why. Come on, be an honest reader and read the whole thing. Do you know why he insists different salvations? Because he insists in leaving the verses, right. in abiding by the King James Bible. You'll notice that mentality. That is your best argument, huh? Let me add this. David committed adultery and murder. Let me add this. Uh, Moses committed murder. Let, uh, Peter cut off a man's ear. 
It, did Ruckman do that? Did I do that? If I did that, then you'd all disown me and say, I don't believe in dispensational salvation. You got to do the fair thing with all these people. Yeah. What a spectacular argument against dispensational salvation. Pointing out the imperfections of people. How would you like somebody to point out your imperfections, trolling you every moment of your life? There is something seriously wrong with you. You know why it's so easy for you to point out imperfections in people? You're not used to it of someone trolling you, pointing out your imperfections. Amen. What kind of a spirit is that? What kind of spirit do you people have to follow something like that? I really am sad. I mean it. It is sad. It is sad. 